Yes. Uh, in the title, it's uh, wrote in uh, within 30 days. But mm -hmm. do you follow the person's answer? Yes.
You have the same graph when you compare with the general uh, population or <coughs> 
we would not know most of the time by the political population. Yeah, most of the time it comes from the many different stories, and we would not know what they would do. We could try to track the you know, second laser and the laser and so on. But the interest is that, you know, as we have the first thing to ask in our time and we would already do that, you know, from, from, from maybe the same time. So actually, the title was quite good, as the following is in population. Then, for example, we found that there are even slowly over 70 kids from the population, then we found that there are even slowly over 60 kids. So, you know, so if we just try to compare this, this graph, I guess we would have to, you know, start the population, and then I think that we would not know whether it is a selection of students. So, this is just the two, you really have a sample, which is, which is, uh, what is the speaking of? Right, that is on the two of the population. It doesn't matter what it is on the two of the population. Yes. So, speaking of sample selection, uh, uh, some of the arguments you uh, raised uh, seem to apply more to those kinds of conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. kind of people, right? Uh, and uh, my worry is that your sample underrepresents these people. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. 
Don't you think that is the key effect? I mean, it's procrastination. So you're not convincing anybody who's unconvinced. You're just making sure that lazy people actually go. And I think our own experience with paid referent reports indicates <laughs> that that's how it works. general discussion at this point but wouldn't that be the kind of question that you would like to ask in your service because if it's just procrastination that you're mm -hmm. impeding then there are no negative effects you're just getting lazy people to go out and get the vaccination yes um, and so could you ask things about other preferences about you know whether people are always in time or not mm -hmm. about whether people regularly check the state of their bank accounts to see if there are mistakes.
one good question could be asking about voting behavior. Mm-hmm. Which people do have a political preference and mm-hmm. they don't vote because they can't be bothered to vote. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will check. I will check whether we are still seeing them down in the same thing, but I will see the way. 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 I will Why people are averse to incentives? 
they will study whether universalism depends on how these countries are to Maybe people like to convert to Chinese countries, but you have Chinese respect to that thing, for example. I, or who is the Chinese group that is interested in this, uh, these incentives? Maybe people are just, you know, not uh, willing to give incentives to, to, to one type of population, but also that we are found in the interest of another type of population. And how prevalent is the version of financial incentives across different types of regions? So we're going to focus here on covenant investigation, because it's a fellow, you know, uh, framework that we, that we have been using. But also, we're going to try to measure whether this is the case of with other kinds of outcomes. So, how will we do it? We will we created this thing that we call the policy. So we want to have a lab in which people can make decisions for others, can use interventions on others, so that we can see in a strategy phase way, in an incentive compatible way, to what extent they like from policies or they like from other policies instead. So what we do is we will have two samples. Okay? And this is the, you know, the the key part of, 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 of this presentation, or the design of this project. So, the point to tell this will be individuals who are 65 plus, and who have not yet completed the COVID-19 vaccination schedule, and they are drawn from the previous general population sample. Okay, so we know that they have to take four steps, they have not yet taken four steps. We participated in an online study in which we allocate them, we can allocate them to different policies. For example, we can allocate to incentives. And then the options that we get from them is the three phase to data on the vaccines that take, which is the delays, and also a follow up survey to measure the impact uh, of these incentives on other potential variables. Okay? So these ones are kind of a sample, you know, that we can experiment with, okay? that we can assign, that we can assign uh, interventions. And then we have the main sample that we are interested in in this paper, which are the policy plans. The policy plans are a representative sample of the previous population. We have about uh, a thousand people. And then each panel is assigned to a hundred targets. And we tell the panel, you can now decide which policy to use on these people. And then we'll talk a bit more now about which type of policies to use we are talking about. And then we say, the decision of one out of 650 panels will be implemented. So you make your decision, and then there's some time that actually the decision that you make will be implemented on this people. And these people will be assigned this policy. Yeah. yeah. So uh, feel free to you know, shut, shut me down if that's not interesting. But So I feel like you're more going to focus on the behavior of sample two here. Now, I, I wonder whether sample one is a particular. So we were talking about the elderly, but the elderly that does stuff online. What is that guys? We're going to look exactly at this. Uh, so um, the reason we focus on 65 plus is that these are the only ones who are still recommended to get you know, uh, an additional booster shot at the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and then, you know, for uh, ethical reasons, we can have two people into the uh, vaccine that we are not vaccinated to get. Right. So we, we, that's the only reason we focus on this on this sample. That uh, that we are still recommending that it would still be good for them according to public health guidelines to get to get the vaccine. Um, we're going to see. We're going to check though in the end whether there's any particularity with this sample with this target group, or whether you know the preferences are different. For example, if we talk about everyone rather than elderly, or if we talk about different amounts, for example, we're going to talk about something like this. It's a good question. Very good. The question is, is there a public conversion against financial incentives for a public behavior? What we tell people is we say, look, you can offer this, this package to the target group. So we are going to, if you say yes, I will send you some this policy, and send this policy is the following. We offer you 20 euros. If you take an additional study and think that you know, we can spend two days of what is getting in this study. We will check with the public health agency if you have your system additional dose of COVID within the uh, within 30 days. If you have taken a dose, we will pay you 20 euros. And then we will say, make the right thing appointment more likely to be here. Do you want to assign this policy to a group of 100 individuals, or do you not want to do that? This is a checklist, by the way, almost the same word by word 
you were interventing at the beginning in, in, in our previous study, in which you may have found that this intervention actually is, is effective at getting people together. And one question, since you didn't give us that information. In the previous study, both the control and the um, other group had the, the possibility of making an appointment with Yes, yes. yes. Both of them. Both of them. The only thing in the other study that we changed was, was this, and, and maybe, you know, uh, exactly, this part. Yes. What do we say? What do we think? And I will keep talking about being opposed, being uh, uh, incentive averse. So this is a paper about being averse to incentive. So I will, I will uh, be writing, you know, this girl not attacking the policy. Okay. Who is not attacking the policy? So if three percent of the people are saying no to signing this policy to this group of attacking people. Now, these fifty-three percent who think that this, these people are averse to incentives. It could be that these people, I don't know, are, 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 are averse to to uh, to uh, to vaccines in more generally. They think vaccines is not important any longer. We should not be uh, encouraging people to get the vaccine. Uh, or it could be, you know, uh, the, the, any other potential reason they don't want to, you know, to be to, to be intervening in a group of 100 people. They will do their, their thing. Yes. Uh, are they aware of your previous study that showed that the uh, incentives worked? Well, they, they, are, they are not. I mean, technically, they could if they, if they read silence, uh, but, uh, but very likely they are not. <laughs> Actually, not. So we, were, we were very careful with this, so our names were not, <laughs> were not in the recruitment uh, uh, tactics, uh, just in case you know, they could Google us and, uh, and, see, and see what we have been doing. So, in theory, not. I mean, I don't, I don't uh, describe it with one percent of them. I swear that we will survive that. Uh, but uh, I don't think this, is, this, this will be the this will be the case. Now, so we want to compare actually this 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 version that we find here with just assigning another policy that has no incentive. Okay, we try and then, then we can see, you know, is this that just people that want to encourage others to get the vaccine? Or is it just, you know, the the other version of the incentive? We compared with this information policy, in which we just say the public health industry recommends that people in your age group take four doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. You can get an additional COVID-19 vaccine dose at your closest vaccination center. Also, make your vaccination appointment now by taking here. And then you can say you are signing this policy or, or you do not. What do we find? The very few people are averse to using this policy. So, uh, only 20% is no. To use in this policy. And while in the other one, 53 percent are saying no to using that policy. Now, this gap here you know, can be interpreted as just you not wanting to use incentives to push others to get, uh, to get the vaccine. And now we want to understand why. And before getting there, let me tell you so a potential concern that we might have here is that many of these people you know, do not care a lot about this decision, right? So, what we would be obviously we uh, incentivize the question when we elicit the willingness to pay to use each of their policies. So do you actually care? Do these ones really care about not using the policy? Do they feel strongly about it? And do these ones also uh, to waste some big time? So here we see that actually those who say no to using the incentives. For the five percent of the sample are actually willing to pay more than 25 years of their own pocket money not to use this policy on the group of 100 people. And this is an incentive compatible. So we answer this in an incentive compatible way. They are willing to take 25 years or more just so that these people never get these methods, never get the incentive policy. And then those who actually use it, they have to go positive and towards it. So the other ones, the ones who are not against uh, incentives, they are willing to take more than 25 euros of their, from their own pocket in order for, for, for these incentives to be, uh, to be sent to be sent away. And also those in the information policy, we have, we have pretty much the same. Those who do not want to use it, they say very strongly, so these ones are probably anti-doctors, people who do not even want to remind people about vaccination because maybe they think that vaccination is, is, um, is, is harmful. Uh, but those who, who say yes, we are willing to pay quite a bit to use this money. So 
Now you're there are people who really feel about selling the information policy, about encouraging people to get the vaccine, but at the same time, they are willing to pay a lot for people not to be found an incentive in order to get the vaccine. Okay, so this is what we call uh, incentive aversion. We're going to try to, uh, to, uh, to disentangle where this data is coming from. Mm-hmm. Now, the second question that we have is how do people perceive the impact and the ethics of financial incentives? So, what we're saying is we tell them, look, we will take, regardless of what you choose, what you chose will be a item of group of people, but we will take a higher people who will be in the control group and a higher people who will be in the incentives group. For sure. This will be for sure. And now we want you to understand how many more people in the incentives group will, for example, get the vaccine, or will say something in the follow-up study. So we have, for example, effectiveness, uh, and effectiveness of 10 percentage points means that people think that those who are finding incentive policy will be 10 percentage points more likely to get the vaccine than those who are found the control group. So it looks like people believe that incentives will be quite effective. You know, the 10% of the points more people will get the vaccine. And even the future of TAPE, the researchers are very worried that, you know, the maybe future of TAPE is, is time when you offer people incentives for a vaccine now, then they are less likely to, to get a vaccine in the future when there's no incentives. People actually think that if anything, they are more likely to get this future, this future vaccine. Also, uh, researchers are very concerned about, you know, the carving out of intensive motivation and also safety perceptions. People are not, do not really think there will be big impacts here. And if anything, we expect them to be positive. People to be more moral when they have been offered incentives. People to be less skeptical of the vaccine when they have been given incentives. This is very small effect, so I mean, we can interpret them as, as, as pretty much no. But we are not concerned about this as researchers. Yes. And do you distinguish between the short and the long run? I mean, how, how is the question? I mean, so the question is about the next dose. But I may be concerned about what's happening to a society in which everything is monetized. Okay. So, so what, uh, the, the way we do it is here we say, you know, the, 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 whether they will take the dose within 30 days, whether they will take the next booster shot dose, and this one, uh, we, we tell people we're going to study these people 30 days after they have been, you know, encouraged or not to get the vaccine. And we're gonna, you know, we, we tell them exactly which questions, more questions we're gonna, we're gonna give them. Safety perceptions about the vaccine, not to whether they, they felt pressured when they got the vaccine. Short one, exactly. Now, if this, if these dimensions maybe, if some people think that these dimensions emerge in the long run, only, I would expect, uh, you know, maybe, maybe people to think that, that repeated payments. Could, could have this long run effect. In this case, it's just one shot. I I have it to believe maybe that people will think that one shot payments will not be harmful in the third one, but maybe the second one. Maybe it could be. This is Michael Sandel's argument. Uh, I, in, in his book, uh, uh, The Moral Limits of Markets. Yes, but I not think. Not the one shot that matters, but exactly. it's, uh, the generalization exactly. of payment for organ, for oh. donation, and so on. That will erode so totally, totally, totally. So we cannot get a deal because we don't have repeated payments. But also, you know, these people are making a decision on whether to have a one such payment uh, or not. Uh, so, um, so we don't have these, uh, you know, the 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 preferences for this for this type of you know intervention. But you're completely right that uh, then we cannot say anything about you know maybe repeated payments can have any. I can have a, an, another effect. Um, there's no evidence, by the way, on this. So, if anyone is interested in this topic, uh, I'm, I'm actually super interested uh, in whether you know maybe repeated payments can have other effects that are very different from the from the ones that we see with one set payments. So we are focusing here on on on, on what one set payments. So what we see is that people think they are effective. People think that people are more likely to also take even the future dose, but they also think. They, they would have felt pressure. So they say, you know, that five percentage points more people in the incentive group will say that they felt pressure when it comes to getting when it came to getting the, the COVID-19 vaccine as compared to those in the control group. Okay? When we compare this to the information policy, 
which is actually the biggest gap uh, for this year. People think that incentives are more effective than you just giving information. But people think also that the information will not be coercive, but the incentives will be coercive. So people will have to help uh, when, when getting this. Uh, and we will now try to understand whether we can explain any... Sorry, but there's also a big difference in morals. Yes, the, uh, and, this, and this one is actually uh, uh, a puzzle that, uh, that we don't know where this is coming from, actually. It doesn't explain anything when it comes to the version to incentive. But, uh, yeah, people think that maybe people will be... Yeah, I, we, we don't know what's going on in here. People think that, that the information... So the incentives will not really affect moral and safety perception, but the information uh, might might affect them in a positive way. Okay, but we're going to see which ones now now predict uh, actual 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 version. Actually, we can even take a look at at here. Uh, oh, this is the right. This. What is that? This one, yeah. So people, when it comes to explaining whether they assign incentive aversion in the first in the first uh, question or not, what people seem to care the most about are effectiveness and pressure. So uh, and I'm not so So if they think that that the, the incentive will be very effective, then they are less likely to be incentive averse. If they think that incentive that the, the incentive will create more pressure. Then they are more likely to be to be incentive averse. Okay, and, but now we're going to get a, a, a bit, you know, finer finer way to to, to, to explain this incentive aversion. I just give me uh, a, a couple of minutes. But they, they actually do not care. Do not seem to care actually about morals uh, or or safety. That was a little bit the uh, the point. What about ethics? What do people think about the ethics of, of uh, incentives and information? So we say, in your opinion, we ask, in your opinion, how ethically acceptable is each of those policies? And we found that uh, about 42% of the participants say that incentives are from somewhat unethical to very unethical. There are very few of the incentives, less than zero than 10%, the incentives are, are very ethical. So most people are say that it is a neutral policy or an ethical policy. While when we asked the same question for information, we found actually that people are much more positive. Almost no one thinks it is an ethical to be this information. They think you know, it is neutral or very ethical. And now we want to try to understand whether we can explain the initial gap. You remember the initial gap where 53 percent are worse incentives, while only 20 percent are averse to, to information, whether we can explain this fact by using this data on protection and this data on ethics. Okay? So why are people averse to incentives? The way we do it is we construct a data set where you can imagine that there each two rows is the subject, okay? And then each row is whether you support incentives uh, and then another row is whether you support uh, information. Okay, so what we can do is we can look at whether we support a given policy with a set of controls and whether this policy is is uh, is incentive policy. Okay, so we can see we can look at the gap between supporting incentives or information policies, and we can look at whether when we add controls here, for example, for questions or ethics, whether we close this gap. When we initially do that, and we just have the pre-registered controls, just the uh, social demographics, we see the incentive version is minus 0.3. So people are 30% more opposed to incentives, 30% uh, 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 more opposed to incentives as compared to, to information. When we add imperfect perceptions, we do not see this coefficient changing at all. Notice that we have quite a bit better R squared. We are explaining the data much better, but at the same time, we are not explaining the gap. Why is this the case? Because remember, the incentives 
has one positive dimension and one bad negative dimension. The positive one is, is that they are more attractive. And this you know, makes people more positive towards the temperature. The negative one is that they perceive that people will be more pressured. And this makes them less positive towards the temperature. And then in this case, we see that actually both, both uh, 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 cancel each other. And in the end, when we account for their perceptions, we see a similar, similar, a similar version. So this would speak to the fact that even if we tell people about our results, or about at least the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the fact that incentives are effective, then we will not manage to, to you know, to change, uh, to change my incentive version. What happens when we just include the moral perception variables? We suddenly feel this entire gap. Basically, everything is explained by the fact that some people think incentives are ethical, some people think that incentives are unethical, and just including this variable, Helps us understand entirely why people are averse to incentives. So it doesn't it doesn't look like this this data this aversion to incentives is driven by just people thinking that incentives backfire or that incentives are not effective. It looks like it is driven by just people thinking that plainly incentives are unethical. It is unethical to use this policy to change people's behavior. And then not much changes of where we are. And all of these, all of these variables. Now, the big question then is, why are incentives unethical, right? And we, when we have our economy hat, it is hard to see that, right? I mean, it's just changing a little bit the environment. People can make a new decision, and, and, and then they, they will make a decision that's best for them. But people do not think in that way. We are the we are those here. Now, let's try to understand why people think the incentives are unethical. What did we do? We actually went to a sample of 200 people and we asked them, why do you think incentives are unethical? Okay, well, we actually asked them, do, uh, are incentives ethical, are they not? And those who said they are not, why are they unethical? Okay. We took all of this data and we put it in ChatGPT. ChatGPT is amazing at this. We asked ChatGPT, give us the main reasons why people think that incentives are unethical. And it gave us these five reasons. First one, incentives are against the values of individual self-determination and autonomy. So this means, you know, I am self-determined and autonomous when there are no incentives. You add incentives and you're, you're harming, you know, my, 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 my decision and my autonomy. People have a moral obligation to get vaccinated to protect themselves and others. Money should not be a motivator. Incentives are a form of bribery that compromise the integrity of the action. Incentives are unfair to those who have been vaccinated, uh, vaccinated or those who cannot get vaccinated for medical reasons. And incentives exploit vulnerable populations by taking advantage of their financial needs or limited access to information. What we did is we just included all of these questions in our survey, and we ask them to what extent do you agree with the following statement? Okay, offering uh, 20 euros uh, incentive for vaccination to the 100 individuals is an ethical because, and then we ask them why is it an ethical? What did we find? That the only two variables that matter when it comes to explaining their aversion to incentives were autonomy and bribery, meaning. That uh, people thought, you know, that that incentives. So this one is people thought that incentives are affecting people's autonomy. The pure decision is the one I make when there are no incentives involved. That's the pure. That's the, the good one. That's the the one that that, that made me an autonomous person. If you're polluting this decision with incentives, with financial incentives specifically, then I'm no longer autonomous. Okay, and this is explaining quite a bit of the incentive version that you see. And the second one is bribery. Just, you know, this plain argument, incentives are bribing, and bribing is wrong. That's, that's why it's unethical, because bribing, uh, bribing is wrong. And these ones are, the, you know, the, the two variables that explain by far the most uh, this incentive version that we, were, that we were discussing before. Now, what are the attitudes for different incentive types? Entirely good. 
Now, it could be that this, this, this uh, uh, effect that we are finding, this, this incentive version, uh, applies maybe to just five incentives, which is what we have been using. I mean, other types of incentives do not really have, you know, have found this user version. So what we do is here, we are only using survey data, like we already very carefully and in strategic growth way analyze, you know, uh, people's aversion. Then we look uh, at whether their survey answers about whether they would support or not an incentive at the, at the general population uh, uh, level in, in Sweden, whether they match their previous answers and they match very closely. So all of these questions are just survey data, okay? And we ask them, you know, to what extent would you oppose the government offering 20 euros cash for everyone who gets the vaccine. We have 56 percent. Remember that the, what we got before was 53 percent. It's very, very, very close. Maybe when we tell them that it's a tax deduction and no longer cash, maybe they are more positive. Maybe when we tell them it's a voucher that you can use in the local store, maybe they are more positive. Or maybe when we tell them that it's food and drinks that they can use, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are less adverse. What we see is that they are not uh, less averse. So, pretty much regardless of how we would pay this money to people, they are quite equally averse. They just don't like you know, these incentives to be to be used for uh, for, for for pushing people into getting the um, the COVID nineteen vaccine. So they arguably think that a voucher and a food are as unethical. Offering a voucher and, and, uh, or food are as unethical as just offering the like, uh, cash to people. Now, we can go to that question. Uh, to what extent uh, could it be that, uh, that the effect that we are finding is just maybe because the target group is, is, uh, is, an, uh, is, 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 is old, like it's 55 plus people. And maybe, you know, if it was for everyone, maybe I would not be against uh, incentives for, uh, for some reason. So, uh, so we can look at this. Uh, we can say to what extent do you uh, do you uh, uh, oppose or support that the Swedish public health agency offers 20 euros to everyone who's 65 plus to get the vaccine? We actually find just with this survey question exactly 53 percent people who are opposing to it. When it comes to everyone, 61 percent, even more people oppose to it. When it comes to offering less money even more people oppose, and when it comes to offering a lot of money, 100 euros, the opposition is even even larger. So it's interesting, when it comes to the target group that we're using, which is 65-year-olds and offering 20 euros for 65-year-olds, people are less averse to, than, than if we would offer you know, different types of incentives or we would have different, different uh, target groups. Any questions? Okay. Let's move then to the, to, to the last part. Attitudes about incentives, perfect, thank you. Attitudes uh, towards incentives for other health behaviors. Now the question here is, you know, is this, is this only something that happens when it comes to vaccination? Why are people just averse when it comes to, to vaccination? Or does it extend to COVID-19 vaccination? Or does it extend, for example, to also flu shot vaccination? Or cancer screening? or uh, smoking, or other types of behavior. So here we, 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 we try to look also with similar type of, of study questions, whether people's aversion to incentives changes depending on which, on which uh, domain we're looking at. What did we find? We find that actually there's quite, quite a bit of heterogeneity. And surprisingly, very much surprisingly to us, people are not against offering incentives for blood donation or for organ donation, okay? So, actually, the literature on, you know, markets and repugnant goods is typically focuses on these on this, on this two fields. If I think people are even more adverse to incentives when it comes to, you know, cancer screening, smoking cessation, COVID-19 vaccine, flu shot vaccine, we also have exercising, people are averse, offering incentives for uh, exercising, we actually have to use another, in another survey that we are running as we speak, uh, actually. Uh, and we also have uh, about 56% who are against, against, uh, against these incentives, or 50 something percent. So, um, so yes, so we see that actually these incentives are not, do not only apply, these, uh, these aversion to incentives does not only apply to COVID-19 vaccines, but also to wider range of, 
uh, of health behaviors. Yes? Do you see this heterogeneity can be explained by the fact that uh, when you stop smoking, it's for yourself, but when you give your blood, you have no any benefit, but you just have benefit. So this is actually, so when I mentioned that, that we are running another study as, as we speak, we are gathering data, we are trying to look into this. We are trying to look into how can we explain this such as in aid. Um, we are looking at different domains and what might be the reason behind this such as in aid. And uh, I think I will have time actually. So yesterday at 1 a.m. I looked at all the data that we had gathered so far. Now we are gathering more data. But and I, and I ran a couple of analyses that I that I added as an extra slide here, and I can I can show you what we are what we are getting when it comes to, to explaining this type of uh, of uh, uh, oxygenators. So these are actually the new studies that we are running. So we are of course running the target study. Actually, um, all of these are happening as we speak. <laughs> this this week we're we're getting most of this data. The target study, which means we're going to be able to look at whether for this sample incentives work and to what extent and whether they have negative unintended consequences. So those graphs that you saw with the expectations of the effect, we're going to have an additional dot on the actual impact of those uh, of those uh, of those effects of, of the of the um, information and incentive uh, uh, group on all of these variables. Mm -hmm. But we don't have much yet. I mean, we, we, we will match the data with the public health agency on January. Uh, now, we also have a general population uh, study where we look exactly at this. So first, we replicate exactly our results that uh, people are averse to incentives in exactly the same way. Okay, so we, we find exactly the same results with this, uh, with this additional sample. So the uh, the preferences from May, where we ran the initial sample, to now November haven't haven't changed. People are as averse to incentives, and we also have this new uh, this new uh, 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 thirty questions on whether they support blood donation, organ donation, incentives for blood donation, organ donation, cancer screening, exercising, smoking cessation, COVID-19 vaccine, and flu vaccine. And here we have. We decided to take the COVID-19 vaccine for everyone rather than the one for 65 plus, just to make it more equivalent. Like everyone now is being offered incentives, okay? And in the in the case before, we only used 65 plus. Okay. So we once again see substantial aversion to incentives for all of these categories, but also substantial heterogeneity. And uh, and uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we also have all of these uh, uh, all of these 30 questions about the effects. Uh, and about uh, the expectations that you know that, uh, and the reasons why people might perceive different 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 uh, behaviors to be differently. And I, I I'm sorry I put together this awful table. This is something you should never do in a presentation. Uh, but I hope you apologize to me because because it was uh, you know like something I did uh, very recently. We just got this data uh, this data in. What we try to do now. If you remember that slide where I said that we are trying to explain opposition to a policy with whether it's information or whether it's incentive, here we try to do the same opposition to a policy with whether we're talking about blood donation or kidney donation or uh, cancer screening, exercise, increased smoking, flu shots, and all of this is with the reference point of, of COVID-19 uh, uh, incentive for COVID-19 vaccine. Okay. Uh, so what we what we managed to do is actually we have all of these potential potential reasons why people might think that that uh, some of these uh, that it is that some of these uh, behaviors are worse or better to be incentivized than the other ones. Okay, so we have for example that just people might think that incentives are more effective for exercising and not that much for exercise. Or that the pressure is different for smoking or for cancer screening, or that deservingness is different, or virtuosity, externalities, internalities, the costs are different. Then, when we include all of these variables, when we include all of these controls, we actually are able to reduce these coefficients by half. So, we can explain half of the heterogeneity that we were seeing, that we were seeing uh, here. We can explain half of them by taking into account 
this this E dimension. And actually what seems to matter the most are these three ones. Effective as pressure and especially whether they think that it's ethical once again. Uh, so it looks like like we can uh, we can explain much of this variation on uh, people's you know uh, heterogeneities of uh, uh, incentive version across across uh, across uh, uh, fields or across behaviors just with these three key variables whether they think it will be effective whether they think it will pressure people and especially whether they think it is ethical or not within this particular. Uh, domain. So whether they think probably that you're affecting the autonomy of the person or not when you're applying incentives in that in that particular domain. And we also very recently have a study on policymakers, and we are once we are still gathering data on this. But our interest is well, in the end, it is not the general population using these policies, but it is rather politicians who have the power to use these policies or not. So we have contacted uh, about 1,600 policymakers in Sweden uh, by, by, by post, and we asked them to participate in our, in our survey where they can actually implement these policies on other people. Some of them, by the way, uh, messaged me that are very upset now, like uh, 10 minutes before we start, I got this email from the admin person in, in Lund saying, well, this is person is very very upset that he wants to talk to you and I had to say I'm giving a, a seminar talk now I cannot talk <laughs> I will I will do that later. I'm getting about ten angry emails per day. The angry emails are saying something like you cannot do that. It is wrong to use incentives for for vaccination uptake. Uh, I don't I I, 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 I I think it's completely unethical and you should you should stop doing this kind of research. Um, what do we find? We find that actually incentive aversion is, is, if anything, even larger among this group. So incentive aversion is slightly larger, but the big difference is that most of them are fine with information policy. There's very little aversion to using information policy. So this gap is actually quite a bit bigger among, among policy, policy makers. And their beliefs are actually quite similar to those of the general population. So uh, they once again are not very concerned with morals or safety perceptions. They think that incentives will push vaccination uptake. They think it will even push vaccination uptake in the future for unincentivized uh, vaccines, but at the same time that it will make few pe uh, people feel pressured. And, uh, and also, you know, they, they, they say that actually it's quite unethical to use. I haven't added this, this graph, but they once again say that it is very unethical to use incentives for uh, for vaccination uptake. Yes, I see that my, my time is, is running out. I can I can wrap up and maybe we can open the room for, for some for some questions. Uh, let me just briefly conclude. So uh, financial incentives for healthy behaviors are often effective. This is something that we see over and over again. And we we still need more evidence uh, on this. There's not a lot of evidence, surprisingly. Uh, uh, but you know the evidence that exists is that these uh, the incentives are actually quite uh, quite effective. Typically, we provide evidence that incentives for COVID-19 vaccination boost in this vaccination uptake, especially if it's for a booster shot. And they have no negative. We find no evidence of negative unintended consequences that the literature are, uh, is, is, is so worried about. Why are incentives not widely used? So people, we find that people are averse. To, uh, to, to using incentives uh, as, as a policy tool. We find that the majority dislikes using them. People think that incentives are effective, but also coercive. So by using incentives, you're coercing people into uh, taking a decision that they otherwise would not have liked to take. And people think that incentives are unethical, they are polluting people's autonomy, they are against individual autonomy, and also they are a form of writing. Now, there are many next questions that we are super interested uh, about, and also I would like to hear your thoughts about them. The two that, that, that we think are especially interesting are, uh, are there ways to make incentives more desirable? Like, should we just then stop caring about, about incentives, because in practice it's very hard to use them? Or can we find ways to make them more desirable? 
Uh, can we can we frame them differently? Can we tell the population about, for example, their effects? Do things change when we when we when we do this kind of thing? And how can policymakers find a support for incentivizing behaviors with positive externalities? So, so what can policymakers do if they want to use incentives in order to uh, you know to, to to be able to do it in a in a way that, that the public will uh, will support? And that's all for for my talk. Thank you so much for for your attendance and for all your fantastic questions. Um, so we have time for uh, about four questions. Uh, it depends what you ask. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, it's a little bit out of the scope of what you were saying, but I've been thinking about it because so what I know is that often it's uh, health insurers that, uh, in, like, that add in this kind of components. So I know that from Germany that there are some health care providers that put in a schedule that if you go to, like, regularly, for example, to the dentist, then you get a higher. Mm -hmm. um, Higher payment on dental replacement or these kind of certain things, and uh, is, is there some literature evaluating this? And is that, so that, that uh, so are you German? This is, uh, this is the comment I got uh, uh, like uh, all the time now from uh, you know from people from Germany. I didn't know this was the case before I started working on this, but apparently you're right that that uh, many many insurance companies are offering this kind of incentives for for healthy cases and even for getting the vaccine as well. I don't think there's any there's any evidence uh, on whether these are effective and whether uh, people approve more of those. But I think it is something super interesting to study. I mean, maybe maybe the problem is if the government does you know take this kind of duty, that maybe the government you know can ask companies, for example, insurance companies, to take this duty, and maybe then it is something that that's desirable and the people the people think is. Is fine. And then we would need evidence on both whether this works uh, and also whether people are, are in favor of it. But I think it's, it's something super interesting. Yes. yes. Maybe one question. Maybe I didn't understand clearly, but in the, post, in the policy lab uh, thing, when you, you put people in the situation as if they were policy makers, mm -hmm. and do you really uh, think they believe they are uh, really allocating uh, this policy to the 100 people or, or cons? That's a good question. I mean, considering the number of angry emails I get, uh, I think the answer is, is often yes. Uh, but also, uh, maybe, maybe more realistically, looking at, at their willingness to pay, uh, the willingness to pay is very high, and we make very clear that they are going to get, you know, money. And these people, the people who are answering the first survey, not the policymakers, but the, those who are answering the first survey, they sometimes they answer about the survey every fourth month or so. And they sometimes are actually, a, of, a, these are experimental economic surveys, so sometimes they get money based on their answers. So I think these people actually believe that, and, uh, and they seem to care quite a bit. They are willing to sacrifice their own income quite a bit for this. So my expectation is that if they didn't believe that they will implement this, then they will choose, choose to maximize their income uh, in their willingness to pay questions all the time. And we would have spikes at zero. And we have no spikes at zero. Actually, all the spikes are, I, I pay a lot to implement, or I pay a lot not to implement. Um, so it's a good question. My my understanding is, is, um, is that they believe that. Maybe another argument for this is that the share who supports and, support and, and, and oppose the policy is exactly the same as when we asked in the survey question. So it looks like, like um, I mean, th th they are very highly correlated, both, uh, both answers. So it looks like they, they actually care about this. Yes, but um, in reality, they don't. They don't really create an effect on the... So how do you deal with the deception? Uh... Oh, no, no, they do, they do. Ah, they do? They do, they do, totally. We explain them all the procedures and they do. <laughs> you know, one in 250 will be random, and they have been randomly selected, randomly assigned to these 100 people, and these 100 people will get the policy that you chose. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Did they know whether they were selected or not for this competition? They didn't know that, no. Uh, they knew that a priori it was, uh, you know, one in 250, 
But no, I mean, because it's, just, it's an anonymous service, so we cannot even get back to them and say, you were the one who was selected in the end. Right? So this was decided after they made their decision, and we cannot go back to them and say you were selected. But uh, maybe there would be an interesting effect there as well. Yes. No, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I want to frame it as an external validity question. Like, I think they're just different policy tools. Like, you can go the, you know, the mandate way. This is a policy tool, but I think it's, it's worth to go in depth and analyzing this. Here we're looking at, at the way of financial incentives. And then, then we're trying, yes. context where it's actually normal to put pressure, like even more pressure on the people to mm -hmm. get Now I regret not having included the question on Monday on my survey to compare it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think, I actually, my feeling is that people might be even more positive sometimes to mandate than to using incentives. Uh, I think those who are against mandates are probably, you know, for similar reasons uh, against mandates as those who are against financial incentives. But I, I, but I would be very interested in looking, in looking into it and comparing both, both types of policy. In practice, financial incentives are often used because, you know, using mandates is often very costly as well for, for governments in terms of, you know, of, of, of the type of, you know, angriness that people, that people have. Sometimes it's even not possible in Sweden. It was not possible even from a, from a law perspective. It was not possible to just ask people to stay, force people to stay at home. Uh, because the government does not have the power to, to, to do something something like this uh, in the short run. Maybe in the long run, if they change the constitution or not, this, it would work. Um, so, uh, so it just, you know, I, I just see this as another policy tool. But I think, you know, a very natural next step and very interesting next step would be to compare this policy tool with other policy tools uh, and see how people perceive them differently and, and, and which one they support more or less. Thank you very much. Uh, let's all give a uh, round of applause to our speaker. And, uh, you know. Thank you. Thank you.